let me get started on your view of what the Chinese leadership is thinking. Of course, you're the author of China Fragile Superpower, which was published a decade ago. And then there you spoke about the insecurities of the Chinese leadership, which is perhaps the biggest threat here. What are the insecurities of this administration and President Xi Jinping? Well, uh, President Xi, of course, has consolidated power in a way very different from his predecessors, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. So uh, instead of ruling through a collective leadership, he really has concentrated power in a more Mao-like, personalistic leadership. Uh, and one of the first things he has to worry about is keeping the other leaders satisfied, because right now, He's using the anti-corruption campaign and more a kind of climate of fear than a real power-sharing system. So the history of communist regimes is always that uh, there's always a risk of splits in the leadership. The second th thing he has to worry about is keeping the public uh, satisfied. Right now we have high pork prices. Inflation is always the greatest risk. In 1989, um, Tiananmen, very important part of that context was inflation. So he really has to keep inflation under control as well as uh, maintaining confidence through, uh, you know, through economic growth. Yeah, and of course the trade war, uh, the sort of reputational, I suppose, the, you know, the, the, the face aspect of it puts pressure on him as well, right? To be able to get a favorable result without being seen to capitulate, as, as the case for President Trump, to his base. Yeah, I think President Trump um, is more directly impacted because of the upcoming election. Uh, President Xi doesn't have an, ele an election to worry about, right? Um, but he does have to uh, not look like this is another form of unequal treaties. So uh, he needs to depict it as something of a win for China as well as the United States. Something that caught my attention in your remarks. Does China really have to care that much about the public? Yes. I mean, they do. Maybe they don't really need to, but the leaders always do. And what they, they don't have to run for election, but they do want to, they're always worried about some mass upheaval. And they have the memory of Tiananmen in their minds, and they have the memory of the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, of course, the Soviet Union did not fall, Communist Party didn't fall as a result of some bottom-up revolution. It was a split in the leadership. The memory of Tiananmen, the possibility of what's happening in Hong Kong could happen yeah. in Taiwan. How does that make Beijing react? And how long do they allow this to continue? Well, that's a question I've been asking Chinese colleagues here when I talk to them. I've been asking is Hong Kong uh, help Xi Jinping politically or hurt him politically domestically? Because the nationalism yeah. is strong. We, yeah, we, what we, I, we the impression we, uh, I have now is that even liberals are nationalists now. Mm -hmm. And there is very little sympathy for the demonstrators in Hong Kong, especially as violence has grown. And so, in a way, it's helped unify support around Xi Jinping. It's not a problem for him that way. In that sense, how difficult does this very strong nationalism of Chinese people, how difficult does it make it for an actual trade deal to happen? I really don't think it's that hard because I, uh, you know, in any negotiation, you have to be able to say that this is a good thing for both sides. And I'm sure that's what will happen. And, you know, I guess the question is, is the U.S. side uh, rational, realistic about this? What about how Washington feels about this. Very shortly, are they sort of overreacting in a sense to the perceived China threat? I believe that China's overreaching and America's overreacting. <laughs> that puts it into context. I really, and I think it creates a really dangerous dynamic. The, the big question of whether it's inevitable that we continue to see the butting of heads given that this is really the great strategic competitive relationship of our time. You know, 
people say that. They say it's inevitable, Thucydides trap, mm -hmm. etc. You know, we heard Henry Kissinger say yesterday we're in the foothills mm. of a, a new Cold War. In other words, this is still only at the very beginning. And I hope that the United States will really think through a sensible strategy for competing, but competing in a way that doesn't lead to us blowing one another up. And um, right now, there's not a lot of that kind of clear thinking in the United States. But uh, I'm hopeful that in a post-Trump administration, there'll be the opportunity to do that. Susan, very quickly, you're off to meet President Xi after this. What do you want to bring up with him? I've been thinking about that. I don't know if I'll have the opportunity to ask a question, but... What would you ask him? I would, I, I would ask him some questions more about the domestic political situation. Um, you know, because I, I'd like to ask him what is, what's going to happen in 2022. Um, because the peaceful turnover of power in China, which was achieved by his predecessors every 10 years, was really a, a stabilizing factor in Communist Party rule in China. So what's going to happen in 2022? Will he remain while all of the other cohort in the yeah. standing committee have to step down? Yeah. It doesn't seem to me that that's going to be something that is necessarily acceptable to the other leaders.